Welcome aboard. You are now at a new stage in your life. What do you want to do? Many of you may not be able to answer this question easily. Some may reply, I have no idea. Do not take the question too seriously. Start with something familiar. For example, you can try to make a lot of new friends, become a regular player on your sports team, learn how to play the guitar, or learn five new English words a day. You see? You can find many things to do. You may say that you do not know how to achieve these things. Well, if that is the case, here are four pieces of advice for you. First, you should have a clear image of your goal. Then you will have a better chance to achieve it. Do you know Hanyu Yuzuru, a figure skater? When he was a little kid, he said he wanted to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. He achieved this goal. When he was 19 years old. Like Yuzuru, successful athletes tend to have a vivid image of the goal that they want to achieve. Second, declare your goal. By doing so, you cannot give it up easily, and you may also get help from others. Here is one good example a high school girl declared her goal to make a box lunch for herself every day. For five months. She needed to get up at five in the morning to make one. She almost gave up, but her family and friends supported her. Eventually, she achieved her goal. What should you do when your goal is too difficult to achieve? The third piece of advice is to take small steps towards your goal. Here is the story of Minamiya Marin. When Madin was a high school student, she set a goal to climb Mount Everest. It was an extreme goal for her because she had very little experience in climbing high mountains. However, she did not give up and took small steps. She trained hard every day and improved her climbing ability. She also found sponsors on her own and collected money to go there. Finally, she reached the top of Mount Everest when she was 19 years old. The last piece of advice is to enjoy the steps towards your goal. You may face difficulties at some steps. Overcoming them will require a lot of your time and energy. However, as Marin said, avoiding things will get you nowhere. Go for it. Instead of running away from the difficulties, try to enjoy the small steps and the whole journey towards your goal. If you get tired, take a rest. It is not a waste of time. So, bon voyage. Enjoy your journey to the fullest. Hello there. Today, I'm going to talk about curry. When you hear the word curry, What country do you think of? Yes, India. Many of you know that India is the home of curry. However, do you know that there is no dish called curry in India? Of course, there are many dishes similar to curry in India. For example, people often stew meat or vegetables with various spices. However, they do not call such dishes curry. A long time ago, the British people began to use the word curry to explain such Indian dishes. This word comes from kari, the Tamil word for a sauce or a soup. In the past, India was a British colony. I think you have learned about it in world history class. In 1772, Warren Hastings, a clerk in the East India Company, Brought back rice and many spices from India. He often ate curry with rice in India, so he wanted to eat it in the UK too. Other people in the UK tried it and liked it. After that, curry gradually became popular in the UK. At the beginning of the 19th century, the first curry powder appeared. Until then, 
people needed to work hard to mix the many spices to make curry. With the help of curry powder, people could make curry more easily, and its popularity spread across the UK. Also, the British began to make curry thicker with flour. They used a recipe for stew, a traditional British food, to change curry to their own taste. British curry later sailed across the sea and came to Japan. Early in the Meiji era, Japanese people first imported curry powder and started to make curry. At that time, curry was an expensive dish. For the price of a plate of curry and rice, a person could eat eight bowls of soba. Also, in those days, curry was a little strange. Surprisingly, people put long green onions and frog meat in it. Since the late Meiji era, curry has been popular all over Japan. Some people say it is because the Japanese military adopted curry as a food for its soldiers. Curry was an ideal food for soldiers living in large groups because they could make it in large amounts. When the soldiers went back home, they took the recipe for curry with them. Because of this, curry became popular in many parts of Japan. With the spread of curry, A lot of new curry based foods appeared in Japan. For example, a Japanese restaurant invented curry udon around 1904. A Japanese bakery started to sell curry filled bread called curry pan in 1927. Later, curry flavored snacks also appeared. You have probably eaten some of them. Among them, curry roux and curry in a pouch were the most successful. Japanese companies exported these foods to countries such as China, South Korea, and the US. Now, astronauts eat curry in a pouch in the International Space Station, ISS. Curry was born in India. Later, people in the UK and Japan started to eat curry. Now, people all over the world eat it. That's all for my speech. Thank you. I suppose you are very hungry now. Let's go to the cafeteria and have some curry. What do you wear to school every day? Most of you will probably say, my school uniform. In fact, nearly 90% of high schools have uniforms. There are many variations among them, such as blazers, jackets with stiff collars, blouses with sailor collars, suits, and one piece dresses. Did you care about school uniforms when you chose your high school? This question was asked to about 2,000 high school students in a survey. Around 20% of high school boys and 60% of high school girls said yes. In the same survey, the students were also asked Do you like your high school uniform? Approximately 80% of the students said yes. Most students feel positive about their uniforms. Many overseas schools also have school uniforms. What are uniforms like in other countries? The uniforms in South Korea are quite like those in Japan. Many students wear jackets and ties. The uniforms in Australia also look much like ours. In some countries, the traditional costume is adopted. As the school uniform. For example, at some high schools in Vietnam, girls wear the native costume called Ao Dai. In Bhutan, all schools have adopted the native costumes called Go and Kira as uniforms. The designs of some uniforms differ because of the religious backgrounds of the students. In Malaysia, girls wear different kinds of uniforms because of their religion. Some girls show their hair, but others cover it with a headscarf. Many schools in Japan have uniforms, but some do not. Over 10% of Japanese high schools do not have uniforms. At such schools, students wear their own clothes. There are also high schools that allow both uniforms and plain clothes. What about overseas? Germany, for example, has not traditionally required school uniforms. In the past, the government considered introducing school uniforms, 
but many people were against it. They worried that adopting school uniforms could limit their personal liberty. Uniforms are not required in most schools in the United States either. Instead, many schools have a dress code. It is a set of rules about clothing and appearance. However, there is a recent movement to adopt uniforms at schools in that country. Some people think that having school uniforms might prevent students from bullying others about fashion. Are you for or against school uniforms? High school students in Japan, the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, South Korea, and China answered this question in a study. Here are some reasons in favor of school uniforms. First, uniforms can prevent bullying about fashion. Second, uniforms can increase students' sense of belonging to their school. Third, uniforms can show the wearer's social status as a student. Fourth, uniforms can put students into the mindset of studying. Finally, some students say uniforms are good because they do not need to pick out clothes for school every day. What are the reasons against school uniforms? Some students insist that they cannot show their individuality or feel free when they wear a uniform. Others worry that their freedom may be limited by a uniform. Others say it is not easy to adjust a uniform to the weather. What is your opinion? Welcome to Yakushima. Thank you for joining our eco tour. I am Suzuki Kenta, your tour guide. I'm going to give you a short orientation before we start the tour. We will return to this office tomorrow evening. First of all, do you know what an eco tour is? On eco tours, people need to be more responsible for the environment. In other words, we need to be more careful not to damage the environment during the tour. Yakushima was registered as Japan's first natural world heritage site in 1993. Since then, the number of tourists has increased. We are very happy to have so many tourists, but this has caused some problems. For example, some tourists have stepped on fragile plants along the mountain paths. For this reason, I would like you to understand the meaning of eco tour. Let's look at the land features of Yakushima. It is a round island, about 500 square kilometers in size. And covered with green forest. If you compare Yakushima with Tokyo or Osaka, you can understand its size. The island has over 40 mountains that are more than 1,000 meters high. That is why Yakushima is called the Alps of the Sea. The climate of Yakushima is warm and humid throughout the year. The average temperature is 20 degrees Celsius in the coastal areas and 15 degrees Celsius in the central areas. However, in winter, the temperature in the mountaintop areas can fall below zero, and these areas become covered with snow. Yakushima has a lot of rain, and it is said that it rains 35 days a month. The annual rainfall is about 4,500 millimeters in the low lying areas. In the mountain areas, it is about 8,000 to 10,000 millimeters. That is why the humidity is high. About 73 to 75 percent on average. This climate has created a unique ecosystem on Yakushima. Now I will show you some pictures of the sites where we are going. The first one is Shiratani Unsuikyo Ravine. It has a dense forest with a thick carpet of moss. Have you seen the animated movie Princess Mononoke? When the director, Miyazaki Hayao, was making this movie, He was strongly inspired by this mysterious forest. The next one is Wilson's Stump, a great tree stump with a diameter of 4.39 meters. Does anyone know the reason why it is named Wilson's Stump? The name came from Dr. Ernest Wilson, a famous botanist. He was the first person to introduce the stump to the world. It is said that this tree was cut down in 1586. By order of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, 
to build Ho Koji Temple. The inside of the stump is empty, and you can go into it. Water flows out of the ground there. The last picture is of the Jomon Cedar. It is one of the oldest and largest cedars on Yakushima. According to research, it is about 2,000 to 7,200 years old and is 25.3 meters in height and 5.2 meters in diameter. In the Edo period, people on Yakushima had less land to grow rice and often had a poor rice crop. So they began to cut down cedars to offer the boards as land tax or nengu instead. Lucky for us, some old cedars were not cut down because they were not suitable for making boards. That is why we can still see cedars over 1,000 years old, including the Jomon cedar. Sadly, we must not get close to or touch the Jomon cedar because we might damage the roots. We can only look at the tree from a distance. This is a chance to think about the purpose of eco tours. That's all for the orientation. Follow me and let's enjoy the beautiful scenery on Yakushima. There was a dog that worked in Kanagawa Children's Medical Center. Do you know why he was there? Surprisingly, this dog, Bailey, was a medical staff member at the hospital. He visited children in the hospital and sat close to them in order to help them relax. He also accompanied them to the operating room, showed them how to take medicine, helped calm them when a nurse took a blood sample, and joined them in walking training and exercise therapy. During working hours, Morita Yuko was always at his side. She was a handler whose work was to supervise and take care of him. Bailey had worked full time at this hospital since 2012. Such a dog is called a facility dog. Bailey was the first facility dog to work at a hospital in Japan. How did Bailey become a facility dog at a hospital? As a first step, he received various types of training with his handler, Yuko. For example, They learned how to act around people with brain disorders. They also learned how to prevent infections. The hygiene problems that dogs could cause for hospital patients was a concern in the beginning. However, appropriate management and proper vaccinations helped ease this concern and allowed them to focus on their work. For the second step, Bailey worked on a trial basis at Shizuoka Children's Hospital. After this trial period, he started his full time work at this hospital. At that time, there were some doubts about his usefulness. However, believe it or not, he easily did things that humans could not do. For example, he helped a boy who had repeated surgery for a brain tumor. And made him smile again. Another boy who could not talk or move his body was able to open his eyes for Bailey. Research provides some interesting evidence to support the positive effects of facility dogs. In an experiment conducted in Hungary, dogs managed to read human emotions in the same way as humans do. Another study in Japan also found. A surprising fact. When a dog and its owner looked intently at each other, a hormone called oxytocin was produced in the owner's body. This is the substance that helps reduce pain and anxiety. This may be one of the reasons why patients feel relieved when they look into dogs' eyes. There is a story that shows how Bailey helped children. Many children. Who had operations wanted Bailey to go to the operating room with them. They were scared of the surgery, but with Bailey, they felt calm and relaxed. This mental state was important for children receiving a particular treatment because it reduced the amount of medication they needed. Bailey not only made children feel relaxed, 
but also enhanced the effects of their treatment. In his eight years of service at hospitals, Bailey supported nearly 3,000 children. On October 16th, 2018, he retired as a hospital facility dog. Many children gathered at his retirement ceremony. At the ceremony, Yasuda Yui, an elementary school student, expressed her deep appreciation for Bailey. Bailey is my friend. He supported me and slept with me in my bed whenever I felt uneasy and was in pain. Thank you, Bailey. Thank you for all of your hard work. Enjoy your life. Eat well and stay healthy. Bailey's job has now been handed over to Annie, Japan's first female facility dog. She is learning a lot from her senior, Bailey, and is calmly engaged in her job. We can find facility dogs in only a few hospitals in Japan. The major reason is the cost. It costs almost 10 million yen per year for one facility dog to fulfill its duties. However, facility dogs are important health care workers for patients and their families. What can we do to find a solution? Words are not the only tool we use to convey our feelings to others. We also communicate them by leaning forward. Narrowing our eyes or folding our arms. This type of communication is called nonverbal communication or communication without words. Nonverbal communication plays an important role in our daily lives. Research shows over 60% of our communication is nonverbal. There are several types of nonverbal communication. We use our arms and hands to show moods, ask questions, And give information. Our faces can also express surprise, happiness, and anger. Body positioning is a kind of nonverbal communication, too. For example, an upright position can show confidence, while a slumped position can show a lack of confidence. Moreover, our tone of voice, clothing, and the physical distance between people are also considered nonverbal communication. Nonverbal communication can differ in meaning from place to place. That is why the gestures of people from other countries are easy to misunderstand. For example, shaking one's hand means no in Britain as well as in Japan, but it can show the opposite meaning in Bulgaria. If you hold your palms open when you talk, most Americans think you are open minded and honest. On the other hand, The same action can give Greek people a negative impression because it is considered an insult. Even universal body language, such as smiling and eye contact, can differ in meaning from country to country. Smiling usually expresses happiness or friendliness. However, in Japan, for example, it can be a sign of discomfort or embarrassment. In the US, people look directly at each other when they speak. It shows interest and honesty. Similarly, people in Lebanon stand close together and look into each other's eyes. It also shows honesty and helps the listener understand the speaker's feelings. However, people in South Korea avoid making long eye contact with their elders. It is more polite to look away from them often during a conversation. Different cultures have different types of nonverbal communication. Take greetings, for example. We bow when we greet each other in Japan, while in many other Asian countries, people press the palms of their hands together to greet people. This gesture spread through the introduction of Buddhism from India. In Western countries throughout Europe and America, however, it is common to shake hands or hug when you meet someone. There are also some unique greetings in the world. Maori people in New Zealand, for example, Press their noses together when they greet. This is to show they share the breath of life. In Tibet, people greet each other by sticking their tongues out because it is regarded as a gesture of respect. Another example is that of the Kikuyu people in Africa. They greet each other by spitting on the other's hand to take away evil and bring good luck. 
You now know about differences in nonverbal communication. Let us consider how you can use nonverbal communication effectively. Some people use nonverbal communication consciously. In Rakugo shows, for example, storytellers entertain their audience by telling stories using gestures and facial expressions. When they perform a character eating soba, they lift their folding fan up to their mouth and make a loud slurping sound. Such gestures help the audience understand the size, amount, or shape of an object, or the actions of characters. Many good speakers use nonverbal communication in presentations. For example, they keep eye contact with the audience while they are speaking. They move their eyes from person to person or group to group. By doing so, the listeners may pay more attention to what the speaker is saying. In many cases, nonverbal communication is unconscious. It can cause misunderstandings because the meanings differ from place to place. On the other hand, it can be an effective communication tool. If you are aware of the importance of nonverbal communication and can use it well, you will be able to convey your thoughts and feelings more effectively to many people. Today, we can find a variety of information on the internet. For example, you can get the news from many countries or information about your favorite movie star. You can also upload information like photos to the internet. We live in an age when anyone can broadcast the information they have. Bana Alabed, who lived in Aleppo, Syria, was no exception. In 2016, this girl was seven years old. She sent a certain message in English to the world on her smartphone on September 24th. The message was, I need peace. In Aleppo, a civil war has continued since 2012. The civil war deprived Bana of everything. She liked studying, but her school was destroyed. She loved her friends, but the war pulled them away from her. Almost every day, she heard bombing and felt terrible fear. When she sent the message on the internet, she thought, I don't know if anyone will listen or care, but I hope that someone will do something to stop the war. Bana's real time messages from a fierce battle zone shocked the world. She wrote that there was no food, no water, and no medicine. She also wrote that people were dying every day. I might die tonight. I am very scared. I might be killed by a bomb. This message was sent on October 2nd, 2016, when bombs fell near her and her family. People all over the world saw an image of Bana with the message. She was staring at the dark fearfully. Her hands were covering her ears to shut out the loud noise of exploding bombs. Bana's messages were gradually shared with people around the world. Many of them sent her messages of encouragement. In 2017, Bana was selected as one of the 25 most influential people on the internet by the American magazine Time. She conveyed the fear of the Civil War from a place where journalists hardly went. This was the reason why she was selected. Because of the great influence of her messages, the Syrian government regarded her as a dangerous person. To protect her, Bana's family was evacuated to the neighboring country, Turkey, in 2016. Even after leaving Syria, she did not stop sending messages for peace. She was not only active on the internet, but she also sent letters to the leaders of some countries. She wrote in the letters that everyone in the world should live in peace. Unfortunately, because of the complexity of the situation, messages for peace alone could not end the war. So, did Bana's words mean nothing? Were the messages of encouragement to her meaningless? Bana had this to say.
as I hid in the basement for hours and hours. Mom and I would read the messages. Reading them, we felt people cared about us, and we weren't alone. When I was taking photos and videos on the street, people said, Thank you, Bana. People liked me telling the whole world not to forget Aleppo because they all thought they had been forgotten by the world. The story about Bana shows us the great potential of the Internet. It has closed the distance between people in different places. The words of a girl in a battleground were delivered to people around the world. The words of people around the world encouraged her and the people in her country. Many people realized the preciousness of peace again through her messages. Some people who received them became interested or participated in peace movements. All these events tell us that social interactions on the Internet may help solve global problems. Bana hopes that not only the war in Syria, but all wars everywhere will soon come to an end. Her wishes are shared by many people all over the world. What do you want to be in the future? There are various occupations, such as teacher, engineer, nurse, and lawyer. However, in the future, in a society with advanced technologies, such as artificial intelligence, AI, your dream job may no longer exist. Even if it still exists, the content might be very difficult. Also, there might be new jobs that do not exist today. What are your criteria for choosing a job? There are many factors to consider. How about salary? Some of you may say a high salary is most important. However, not everyone thinks so. In fact, some people are interested in making society better through work. They start new businesses to solve social problems. These people are called social entrepreneurs. For example, Florence Nightingale can be considered a social entrepreneur because she founded the first nursing school. Thanks to her, the modern profession of nursing was established and we can receive good care in hospitals. Saisho Atsuyoshi and Miwa Kaito are Japanese examples of young social entrepreneurs. They started working to change education in the world when they were in university. In 2010, They were interns in Bangladesh, which is said to be one of the poorest countries in Asia today. Walking in a village around midnight, they saw high school students studying hard under the streetlights everywhere. The students wanted to enter college and get a good job to help their families out of poverty. However, they could not study at home at night because they were too poor to have electricity in their home. So they were studying under the dim streetlights every night. Saisho and Miwa were surprised at these sights. Even worse, there was a shortage of 40,000 teachers in Bangladesh, and the lack of high school teachers was especially serious in poor villages. To support poor students, they decided to do something. Their idea was to record the lessons of charismatic teachers on DVDs and deliver them to students in low income families. Saisho and Miwa set up an NPO. Non profit organization called e education and raised funds. They looked for charismatic teachers in Bangladesh and persuaded them to cooperate on the project. In 2010, they recorded lessons and delivered the DVDs to 32 high school students in a poor village. The students repeatedly watched the DVD lectures. As a result, 18 students in the village were able to enter universities. One of them was admitted to Dhaka University, the top university in Bangladesh. The following year, two more students entered the university. By 2017, over 200 students had gone on to major universities in Bangladesh. The mission of e education is to deliver the best education to every corner of the world. Over 20,000 high school students in the world have received the DVD lessons. In addition to Bangladesh, e education has provided educational support in more than 10 countries, such as the Philippines, Myanmar, and Nepal.
In 2012, for example, a typhoon hit Mindanao Island in the Philippines, causing severe damage. A large number of children dropped out of school. Miwa and his supporters cooperated with local schools and governments to give the best education to those children. In Bangladesh, many young people who learned through the video lectures are now working actively in society. There was a high school student who said, I want to change the education system so that everyone can receive a good education. He finished graduate school and got a job at the Ministry of Education in Bangladesh. Now he is working hard for the realization of his dream. Another student wanted to help people suffering from money problems. He thought that a bank would be a suitable place for learning about money. After graduating, he started working at a foreign bank. Miwa, the representative of e education, Feels that high school students in Bangladesh have great passion for their future. He says that they are sure their lives will improve if they study harder. They seem to be working not only for themselves, but also for their families and society. They also seem to enjoy studying. Through his experiences, Miwa advises high school students he meets by saying, Think about what problems you want to solve for someone. That will lead to a good career goal for you. What problem do you want to solve for someone and society? If I were an astronaut, I could go into space. A lot of people dream of traveling to space, but not everyone can be an astronaut. Many distinguished people try to get into spaceflight programs, but only a few of them are selected. Even if they are selected, they must succeed in the hard training. In the end, only a small number of people can achieve this dream. However, we should not give up too easily. Now there is a promising scientific technology that may make traveling to space simple. It is called the space elevator. According to Ono Shuichi, The president of the Japan Space Elevator Association, JSEA, anyone will be able to ride the elevator into space, just like traveling abroad. This sounds like something out of a science fiction story. However, he says this could become a reality by the middle of this century. How will the space elevator be built? See A in Figure 1. First, A stationary satellite will be launched to a point about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth's equator. This is the place where the Earth's gravity and the centrifugal force are in balance. Next, as B in Figure 1 illustrates, a cable will be stretched downward from the satellite to the Earth's surface and upward to space to keep the balance. When the elevator is attached to this cable, it will be able to climb up and down, as shown as C in Figure 1. How long will it take to go to space on the space elevator? The elevator is expected to run on electricity at a speed of 200 to 300 kilometers per hour. Therefore, the elevator will take one or two hours to reach the height of the International Space Station. ISS, about 400 kilometers above the Earth. In order to reach the stationary satellite, about 36,000 kilometers above the Earth, the elevator will take about one week. The space elevator needs an extremely long cable. It must be about 100,000 kilometers long. That is about eight times longer than the Earth's diameter. Such a long cable. Might be broken by the pull of the Earth's gravity and the centrifugal force. Therefore, the cable must be more than about 100 times as strong as steel. Until the 1990s, no one knew what kind of material would be strong enough for this cable. This was the biggest problem in the development of the space elevator. In 1991, Dr. Ijima Sumio, a Japanese scientist, Discovered a potential material for the space elevator cable. It is called 
carbon nanotubes. If this material did not exist, the space elevator would remain only in science fiction. Carbon nanotubes are made of carbon and are the lightest and strongest material on Earth. They are about 50,000 times as thin as a human hair and about 20 times as strong as steel. Researchers are now working hard to produce a long and tough carbon nanotube cable. Today's rockets require huge amounts of fossil fuel. However, the space elevator is energy saving and eco friendly. The space elevator may use a lot of electricity when it goes up, but it can also produce electricity when it comes down. The electricity can be stored in a battery and used when the elevator goes up again. The cost of a single trip may be about a hundred times lower than that of a trip on a rocket. Unlike rockets, the space elevator will not produce any carbon dioxide. The space elevator has even more potential. We may be able to build space elevators on other planets, such as Mars, too. By using them, it may be possible to send things back and forth between the Earth and other planets. See Figure 2. Like a hammer throw, we could use the rotation of a planet to send things into space without using fuel. The space elevator may soon become a reality. Someday in the future, even elderly people and children may be able to go into space without any special training. On March 17, 1985, during the Iran Iraq War, Iraq suddenly announced 48 hours from now, we will shoot down any airplane flying over Iran. Foreign people in Iran began to return home in a hurry on the airlines of their home countries. Unfortunately, at that time, there was no regular airline service between Iran and Japan. The Japanese embassy in Iran made every effort to get seats on foreign airlines. However, the airlines gave top priority to the people of their home countries and refused to accept the Japanese passengers. More than 200 Japanese people were left in Iran. Just when they were losing hope of going back home, the Japanese embassy received a phone call that said, Turkish Airlines will offer special seats for the Japanese people left in Iran. Two planes from Turkey appeared in the sky and helped the Japanese out of Iran. There was one hour and 15 minutes left before the deadline. The next day, the Japanese media reported the rescue as headline news. However, they did not know the real reason why Turkey saved those Japanese at the risk of being shot down. The Turkish ambassador to Japan explained later, One of the reasons is that the Turkish have good feelings towards the Japanese. This is because of the Artural accident in 1890. What was the Artural accident? It happened in Japan in the Meiji era. On September 16, 1890, a strong typhoon hit Oshima Island, Wakayama. Stormy winds began to blow against Kashinozaki Lighthouse, which stood on a steep cliff at the eastern edge of the island. That night, a big man rushed into the lighthouse keeper's room. He was all wet, covered with blood, and clearly not a Japanese. The keepers soon understood that an accident had happened at sea. Whose ship are you on? How many crew members do you have? The keepers couldn't make themselves understood in Japanese. So they took out a book which had pictures of national flags in it. The injured man slowly pointed at the red flag with a white crescent moon and a star in its center. This flag! Turkey! With gestures, the Turkish man told them that the ship had sunk and all the crew had been thrown into the sea. He had managed to swim to the beach and climb up the cliff. The villagers, who heard of the accident from the lighthouse keepers, quickly began to rescue the other crew members. But it was dangerous work in the dark. Some villagers pulled the injured crew members up from the cliff by rope. Others climbed up the steep cliff, carrying the large Turkish people on their shoulders. After that, 
they took their clothes off and, with their bodies, warmed the survivors shivering with cold. The name of the Turkish ship was the Atural. It was an old-fashioned wooden warship with over 600 crew members. The accident happened on their way from Yokohama to Kobe. There were only 69 survivors. If the villagers had not helped them, almost all the crew would have lost their lives. Although the poor villagers did not have enough food for themselves, they offered their precious rice and sweet potatoes to the survivors. Even the women and children gave their own clothes to the naked crew members. When they ran out of food, the villagers even gave them the chickens which were kept as food in case of emergency. Although the villagers did not know any Turkish at all, they encouraged the injured survivors in Japanese and took care of them for three days. The Turkish people thanked the villagers with all their hearts and kept the kindness of the villagers in their minds. Early on the morning of September 20th, a German warship arrived at Oshima to take the survivors to Kobe. Just past noon they were seen off by the villagers, who had taken care of them until just a few minutes before. Arrive home safely. Goodbye. All the crew that could walk on their own came onto the deck. They waved goodbye to the villagers until the port was out of sight. After a three-week stay in Kobe, the 69 Turkish survivors left Japan for their home on two Japanese warships on October 11, 1890. They arrived safely in Turkey on January 2, 1891. A lot of Japanese people learned about the accident through the newspapers and sent money to the families of the dead crew members. Now we understand why the Turkish government decided to rescue the Japanese people during the Iran-Iraq War. The Atural story has been passed on for generations in Turkey and its people keep a strong friendship with the Japanese. The Atural brought Japan and Turkey together. The bridge between the two countries has been built up over time.